Hey, welcome to our Mother's Day service. We're so glad that you could join us. It's time to grab your Bible, your notebook, and your pen. I want to encourage you to just lean in and receive the word that God has for you. Be blessed. Good morning, View Church Tiger McGills. What an awesome privilege it is to be here today and to see so many of you here this morning. Let me see, make sure that my tablet recognizes me this morning. That's good news. Welcome to View Church Tiger Big Hills, especially if it is your first time with us. And I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the house. Again, maybe you're a biological mom, maybe you're an adoptive mom, maybe you're a spiritual mom. They're all incredible. And we are so, so blessed to have moms in the house today. I just want to take a moment to honor all the moms. I want to take a moment to honor parents that come to church week in and week out, that choose to raise their children in the house. It's not always easy being a parent, but just a moment to say well done and for choosing to be here this morning, to start your week in the best possible place that you can be. Well, as Nick introduced me, my name is Lindsay, and I have the amazing privilege of working at View Church Tiger Begills on staff as our executive pastor, and I get to work with an incredible, incredible team. They are a dynamic team. They love the Lord, they serve hard, and they just do everything at the best of their ability. And I'd like to take a moment in their absence also just to honor our lead pastors, Dino and Kelly. They are gonna be back soon. They're on flights right now. But I'd like to take a moment to even just honor Kelly. She is the mom of the house. She's our spiritual leader. She's our mentor. And we get to serve under their leadership. And I can tell you now that whether you've been involved or you've been coming for a while, we're blessed. We really, really are blessed with incredible, incredible leaders. So maybe you've been coming for some time. If not, I'd love to encourage you to go to our website and catch up on the past two sermon series that we have done. The first one that we did was called Live Like Jesus. And it was so, so encouraging as we went through different aspects of who Jesus is and how we can live like Him. Then after that, we went into a series called Lead Like Jesus. And the greatest revelation about this was that every single one of us have a sphere of influence, whether it's a mom's club, whether it's a running club, whether it's in the corporate environment, whether it's with your children, Whatever, we all have influence on people. And leadership is influence, and influence is leadership. And when we realize that every single one of us are a leader, it was an absolute revelation that we get to lead people, not by position, not by promotion, not by title, but we have a, an opportunity to lead people and even if it's leading them to the Lord, we get to do this. Before we get into the word this morning, that's something that God has laid on my heart. And I'm hoping it's going to sort of encapsulate these two series that we've just done. I want to pray for us. So Father God, I just want to thank you for every single person here this morning. Lord, thank you that you are in this place. We welcome your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that as um, the word goes out, Father God, I pray that you're going to encourage us, that you're going to challenge us, but ultimately that you're going to change us. And Lord, right now we give you our time, we open up our hearts, and we say, may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is Love Like Jesus. And I'm so excited because I thought, you know, after doing the two series, what more than speak about the love of Jesus. And this can feel like a tall order, but you know what? We can look at the perfect example, who is Jesus, and see what he modeled while he was on earth. It's going to be the most amazing way. When God sent his son Jesus down to earth, he was human. He was fully human. And we get to see that example of what he lived, and we get to learn from it. And when he died and he rose again, we were left with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we can continue to live like Jesus, lead like Jesus, and we can love like Jesus. So I'm sure the first thing we want to start off with is, what is love? Okay, so 
If I asked every single person in this room today, what is love? I think we were, every single one of us would maybe come up with something different. Maybe some would be similar. But essentially, we would all have a different experience of what love is. We have a different perspective on it. We, um, we may feel that you know, love is an emotion, it's a feeling. We may um, expect love to be shown to us in a certain way. We may show love in another way. Um, you may have heard of the book called The Five Love Languages. And it's such a great book because actually what it essentially does is it breaks it down to five love languages, as the title says. And it speaks about gifts being one, just letting you know, for a friend. Words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, physical touch. Now you see, the thing is, when it comes to a love language, if I, my love language, when I feel loved, it's because you maybe gave me a gift. But what happens is, in order for me to love you, sometimes I give you a gift. The problem is that your, your, yours might be quality time. So me giving you a gift doesn't always bless you. Me giving you quality time might be the best thing that I could do. So I would even encourage you, if you're in a relationship or you know, you've got family, you've got love languages for your children, it's such an encouraging book just to find out how we learn to love each other and speak each other's language. But you see, what I do want to point out this morning is that even as Christians, our love for each other is conditional. You see, what you do for me makes me respond in a certain way. Or what I do for you can make you respond in a certain way. But we know that at the end of the day, that can be a tainted version of what love is. So let me give you an example. I might say to my children, you know, exams are coming up. It's time to study. Get in there. Bring back the goods. You know, work hard. It's going to be amazing. Your children come home. They've done well. You know they did well. They worked hard. They did everything they needed to. So what is our response as a parent? We, we are like encouraging and we're happy and we are like, well done. You know what? You put in the hard work. Good for you keep going. And that child essentially walks away going, I feel encouraged. I've made my parents proud. I've succeeded. I'm loved. Now what happens when your child comes through the door with a bad report? And you know that maybe your child has been lazy. Maybe your child didn't do the work that was expected. And as parents, we take a look at the report and rightfully so, if they're lazy, they need a little chat. Right, parents? But the thing is that sometimes we don't respond in love. What we do is we might attack their character. We may, we may say some unkind things. We may get angry. We may start shouting. And what happens essentially is that we're breaking down the character of that person because we're not speaking the truth in love. Okay? There's a way that we do it. And what happens is that child walks away going, I'm a failure, I've messed up, I'm rejected, and I'm certainly not loved. You see, it's difficult when we, we don't understand that disparity between how we receive love and give love. Some of you might even say, you know what, I don't believe in true love. Because I've grown up in a family where I was told I was loved, but I was severely abused, or there was severe addiction, or there was severe brokenness. And every time, you know, I'd get a hiding, but I would get told how much I love you. Um, and you, you kind of look at it and you go, I don't, I don't even know what love looks like. The only love I've experienced has been painful. Okay? You see, life experience can dictate to us what love looks like. But we know that the perfect will of God is the true meaning of love. God's perspective of love is exceptionally different. So the Greek word in the New Testament, you may have heard this before, for love is agape. And this is the model essentially that when Jesus was on earth as a human being, he modeled so perfectly. So agape, the meaning of the word is the highest form of love, charity, 
and the love of God for human beings and of human beings for God. This is in contrast to brotherly love or self-love as it embraces a profound sacrificial love that transcends and persists regardless of circumstance. You see, biblical love refers to more than just a feeling or an emotion. It's caring for someone regardless of what they can give us back. And this was perfectly modeled by Jesus. Matthew 22 verse 37 says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. So in the scripture, we can see this is a, a two-part instruction or a two-part commandment. It says love God, and it says love people, and it says both are equally important, okay? But now you may be going, okay, are you sure, like, shouldn't you love God first and then you love people? Or you know what, um, I do love God, I really do love God, but people, you can give them. I'll have my dog. Let's be honest. Sometimes we, we look at people and we go, wow, that's complex. Not everyone's lovable, you know? And we, and we try and justify this fact that we can love God, but we don't have to love people. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're going, you know what, I love people. People are amazing. I love my friends. I love my family. But God, you know what, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to connect with you. God, if you, are you even out there? Like, I want to love you, but my prayers are bouncing off the walls. I don't feel the connection. I don't feel like you're there. But you know what? This commandment, it's so, it's so clear that the two are so important, that if we want to love like Jesus, we want to submit to this word. And the way I can just explain it to you, the importance of both of them being equally important, is if I take, I have a five rand coin over here, I have a 10 rand note, and on the front of the 10 rand note is President Nelson Mandela, and on the back, big rhinos. Front of this coin says five rand and something. My eyes are not great. And on the back of it is a coat of arms. And if one side was loving God, the other side was loving people, whether it be the note or the coin, they both make up the currency. They both make up the value of what this is worth, okay? And so we cannot love God without loving people and we cannot love people the way God intends us to love people with agape love, right? Without loving God. Because we will love people conditionally if we don't love God. We won't understand it. So how do we see how Jesus lived a life of agape love on earth? And there's just four things I want to mention today. And there's actually multitudes. I mean, this, I think you could do a series on a series on a series. But I'm going to share four things that have really stood out for me. And the very first thing is that when Jesus was on earth, he loved God. And how did he love God? He submitted and surrendered his will for the Father's will. Okay? He put aside his emotions and his needs and his wants, and he surrendered everything to God. And just an example of this, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it's in Matthew 26. It speaks about Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that trouble is coming, that this is not going to end well. He is going to the cross. He's going to die an ugly death. But he wants one hour to spend praying to his Father in heaven. He takes his disciples along with him, and he says, please keep watch. I'm going to pray. Do you know that three times Jesus came back and they'd fallen asleep? They were much. They could not keep their eyes open. And of course, this disappointed Jesus. And he said to them three times, he said, please keep watch. But you know what's interesting is at the beginning, just part, uh, first portion of the scripture, Jesus is very clear about his emotions, about what he was feeling. And this is what's so beautiful about Jesus, that he was fully human, so we can relate. 
he can relate to us. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus was struggling. And then three times he basically says, he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as your will. The second one, second part of that same, in that same scripture, it says, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. He says it three times and then he ends off and he says, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. You see, he submitted all his emotion, all his pain, and he said, may your will be done. Are we sitting here today going, yo, that's a tall order. We know that life's not easy. We know that we have trouble in this world. We've never been promised an easy life. But are we able to sit and put aside our own agenda for God's agenda? It's difficult, but you know what? We have the helper. We have the Holy Spirit. But you see, when Jesus went into heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He sent the advocate. In John 14, verse 26, it says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. Isn't it amazing? We have the Holy Spirit that helps and intercedes and helps us make the right choices. We do not need to do this in our own strength, church. Even when it's tough, we know that we have got the support and the love of Jesus. The second thing I'd like to just speak about is that, firstly, Jesus loved God, like I mentioned, but Jesus loved people. And it's this two It's this two coin thing. He loved people. And what really stood out to me was that Jesus went after the one. You know, Nick and I've got three children, you may know, the Smith Trio, and um, I'm exceptionally blessed and honored to be their mom. And um, they are very close in age. Jade and Caleb are 21 months apart, and then Aiden and Caleb, Caleb and Aiden, should I say, are 18 months apart. So it's Jade, Caleb, Aiden. And um, they grew up in church from a week old on the floor, wherever they were, and they've grown up in church. And with our involvement and serving, I'm going to be honest with you, I did not always know where they were. Um, the, the Smith trio were causing chaos somewhere in the building. And um, I always used to say to Nick, your God is so good. Like, he really looks after our kids on a Sunday. You know, we didn't always have child care necessarily, but with volunteers and team and, and just amazing church, like our kids were always safe. It was amazing. But you know, had Nick and I left the building and got home, and I am wondering if this has ever happened. I feel like it could have happened. But you kind of go one, two, three, and you make sure everybody's in the car, you know? Or you get home and you're like, one, two, three, right, everybody got out the car, this is all good. Maybe they've brought a friend, so you've got to count to four, and you definitely want to make sure the friend is in the car, right? Because you're not losing somebody else's kid. But if I got home and Nick and I went one, two, and there were supposed to be three, why don't we don't high five each other and go, Two out of three, well done. Booyah, we've got this. No, no, we panic. Where is the one? Like, that's a problem. We, can't, we had three. We've left one behind. And I apologize to my children if I've done this. <laughs> but you know what's so amazing? Is that Jesus speaks about this. And I was so reminded in the parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18, verse 10 to 14, it says, Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven, their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more then over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of the Father, your Father in heaven, that anyone, that, sorry, that one of these little ones should be lost. Can I be honest with you? If you've been in the shop and you're a parent and suddenly your toddler disappears, you feel sick, okay? 
you start running, screaming, shouting, you're calling, um, you're doing everything to get that, their attention, okay, and make sure that they're okay. Did Jesus not, when he was giving this parable, not experience that same sick feeling maybe? That he was like, you know what, it bothers me that as I walk on this earth and I'm sharing the good news, there's one year and one year and one year that are not responding. And I wonder if he did not have that same gut-wrenching feeling that makes you feel so sick like you've lost a child. Because this parable is going, the rejoicing over the one was far better than over the 99. He didn't give himself a high five if not everybody surrendered their lives to the Lord. I had a, um, an experience on Friday. I didn't go looking for it, but it just kind of happened. And um, I was going off to take a lot. I needed to pick something up. And um, I was driving along one of the main roads on the way to take a lot. And I drove past and on the side of the, the pavement, I saw this man had fallen down. And um, I, I, I took a look and he, he, he did not look comfortable. He did not look okay. He had fallen down onto the pavement and was in a very awkward position. And as I was driving, I just remember going like, Jesus, help him. Like, Lord, help, help that man. Something like just stirred in my spirit where I was like, oh, Lord, just help him. Yeah. Anyway, I went to take a lot. I drove back the same route, but this time I'm on the opposite side of the road. And um, there's an island in between. And as I looked over, this man was in the exact same position that I'd seen him on my way to take a lot. And I looked at this man and I just thought, yo, there's one of three things. He's either dead, he's, or he's dying, or he's very drunk. There was only three options that I had in my head. And my natural inclination would be, just keep driving. Let's be honest, we live in South Africa. How often are we desensitized to those kinds of scenarios? But you know what happened? Something happened in my spirit. It wouldn't settle. And I kept driving. And the very first U-turn option I could see, I U-turned. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not sure where I was going and what I was going to do about it. I, I just thought, I've got to get to this man. He, he needs help. I don't know if I can help him, but he needs help. And anyway, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure what to do. There was another lady that came walking, tried to wake him up. Nothing was happening. And essentially, I was like, you know what, I'm going to call the armed response. That's the best I can do right now because I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into or whatever. But eventually this man came around and he had fallen and really hurt his face. And yes, he was exceptionally drunk. But you know what? When I had that feeling in me to go back, it was like I was going back for that one. It was like God was saying to me, no matter what he's done, no matter who he is, no matter how bad he is, no matter what his life looks like, Lindsay, he is important to me. And I want him to be seen. And I didn't get to share the gospel with him, no. I didn't get to pray with him. But somebody came to take care of him. And I can only pray that his salvation will come, that somebody else may even be part of that story. God did something in my heart that day. You know, God is patient. He does not want anyone to perish. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, it says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to to repent. You see, the Lord is patient. He is waiting for us to submit and surrender our lives to Him. He wants us to love God. He loves, He wants us to love people. The third aspect of the way Jesus loved was how He served actively. You see, nothing about the way Jesus served on earth was passive. Okay? He was, He didn't sit on His hands. How often do we say we serve God? And when we say we serve God, we mean we read our Bible and we pray. And if there's an opportunity for conversation, we chat. You see, Jesus didn't stop there. 
He served, he did miracles, he shared the gospel. He went out and he washed his disciples' feet the night before he would die, okay? He was kind, he was compassionate. He never, ever didn't have time for people. He always made sure he had time for people. It was amazing that he actively served. He did not spend his days just daydreaming. Yes, he did take time for silence and solitude, time to pray and spend time with God, but it didn't stop with just praying and being in God's presence. He got out there and he served his community actively. Again, how do we do it? And Well, we have the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us. You know, we may think, we, you know, we're not good enough or we, not, we, we can't do this. How do I do it? God, what have you given me? Galatians 5 verse 22 speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. And I love the way it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with with a spirit. We've got the fruit of the spirit. Do you know how easy, easy it is to serve someone by being patient, by being kind, by being generous, by being loving? We can serve people. We don't need a whole lot in order to be kind. We don't need a whole lot of resources in order to bless people. We can bless people with what we have got. The fourth thing, that really just stood out to me about the way Jesus loves is that he loves unconditionally. He loved and still loves unconditionally. You see, it's a no strings attached, okay? Whether we love Jesus, whether we give our lives to Jesus or not, he still loves us. Romans 5, verse 6 to 9 says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. You see, while we were still sinners, God did not look for conditions. He did not ask us to tick boxes. He did not ask us to get right and then I would love you. He said, I love you despite everything while you're a sinner. You see, Jesus cared so much and loved so much about our well being and he expected absolutely nothing in return. You know, I look at and so encouraged by our true team. Every single week, they are the social justice arm of our church. Every single week, they go out into the community of Ravensmead and they serve that community. And every single week, they feed them. They don't only feed them, they give them the word of God. They pray with them. They encourage them. They go into small groups with them. They, they serve the children. Do you think there's ever been a week that I have personally ever experienced that they came back going, what did we get? You see, they love unconditionally. They don't expect anything in return. Their greatest joy when they go into that community that's full of poverty, that's full of addiction, that's full of problems, where there's a lack of resources, where there's abuse, where there's brokenness, their greatest victory is when they walk away and they don't know if people have given their hearts to Jesus. I want to encourage you to support their fundraiser. All of that money goes to people that don't have what we necessarily have, that have come out of, like I said, a broken environment. But you know what? By the love that we show them is showing them that there's another way to live, that they do not need to stay where they are, that strongholds can be broken. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Salvation is a free gift from God. You know, I love this, um, this quote that I read by Paul Washer. 
And it says, I've given Christ countless reasons not to love me. None of this, none of them changed his mind. Church, I, I, I kind of get emotional when I think about like the fact that nothing, absolutely nothing that I've done um, has changed Jesus' mind, the way he loves me. I've done everything wrong I can probably think of. I don't know. But you know what? It doesn't stop Jesus from loving me and it doesn't stop Jesus from loving you. Like I said, every time I, I look at this, I think, wow, Lord, it is by your grace. We don't need to tick boxes. We don't need to get it all right because you love us despite all of that. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And just to summarize again, how Jesus loved. Jesus loved God. He pleaded in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus loved people. He went for the one. Jesus served actively. He yielded. He did miracles. He washed feet. And Jesus loved and loves us unconditionally with no strings attached. And church, what is our greatest response that we can have to this? As Christians, our greatest response is that we can share this with the world, with people that are in our sphere of influence, wherever we may be. We can share the good news that Jesus is the hope of the world. You know, I really find that, again, we spoke about this in our view group this past week, and it really just hit home again. So often we don't share our testimony or we, we saved and we're doing amazing things, but we're not sharing who Jesus is with unbelievers and we become complacent and we just expect people to know. But we had a revelation, and well, I had a revelation again and just that reminder that heaven, sorry, that eternity is real. Okay, we all agree. Eternity is real. You know what? Heaven is real. And isn't that exciting? But how often do we forget that hell is also real? And God wants none to perish. And I think when we understand that eternity is so real, that heaven is real, that hell is real, we start caring about that one. We start looking out for people that are in our sphere of influence, that are in our families, that are in our circles, and we start getting concerned. And we need to be the people that share the hope of the world, that tell them there's a Savior named Jesus, that we are sinners, that we recognize that, but we have a Savior. And because of that, their eternity is secure that they do not need to check boxes, that they do not need to do certain acts of whatever it might be, that their salvation is a gift from God. Romans 10 verse 14 says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? Church, we have a God-given responsibility to share the good news with people that do not know a Savior. Just in closing, I think the greatest scripture in John 3 verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Right now, you might be sitting here and going, that's all good. I'm, I'm happy, like, it's amazing, God loves. But you know what, I want to know that Savior. I don't have a personal relationship with Him. I'd love to give a moment just to respond. And just with every head bowed, we're going to just respect each other and give everyone a moment that maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, I don't know my Savior. I don't know my Father in heaven. I don't know this God that you speak about that loves God loves people, serves, and loves unconditionally. I want to encourage you now that if that's you, just to raise your hand quickly. I'm just going to pray for you. If there's anyone sitting here going, today I want to make a decision to follow Jesus. If you can just quickly raise your hand, and I'll know who I'm praying for. Does 
Sini Wanyam. Anyone want to make a decision to follow Jesus? So I'm going to pray before we end off the service. And Father God, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you again. Father God, thank you for the word. We pray, Lord, again, that it has encouraged us, that it's maybe challenged us, and that it ultimately, like I said, will change us. And Lord, I pray for every single person, whether they made a public um, declaration to, to follow you today, Lord, or made a personal decision in their heart, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to their spirits, that you'll speak to their heart, that they'll know that there's a different way to live. And that when they give their lives to you, Lord, it's a life of fullness and an amazing, incredible journey that we get to spend eternity with our Father in heaven. And right now for every single person, Lord, that may be sitting here going, I want to love more like Jesus. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit fills our tanks even more. And Lord, wherever it is that we can show that love more and more and more, we ask you to help us because we have the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you give us everything that we need so that we can share the Word of God with people that do not know you. Lord, right now we give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Wow, what an awesome word that was. I hope that you were encouraged and as blessed as I was. We'd love to invite you to our, our in-person service. So come and join us at our 8.45, 10.15 or 5 p.m. service here at Tiger Bird High School.